<laughs> Hello, all. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm Steve Dunn, I'm the chair of our local uh, AIAA Hampton Road section public policy, and uh, uh, really appreciate y'all being here today. Thank you. Um, I think we have a really nice presentation. First of all, please keep eating. If you need more, uh, there should be, I think there's more back there, but I uh, thought we'd go ahead and get started and try, try to, I'm respectful of your time and maybe end up by about 1230 or so. Certainly there's some time afterwards for, with Q&A and such, but uh, uh, so with that, let me introduce our speaker today. Th let me give a little bit of background on Wright Brothers, which will be real short because I've, my experience has been sort of limited, but it's got a real prestigious past. Uh, you know, it's really one of our major presentations of our local local section. And one of the things Matt and I are working on is to try and really get it reestablished on a regular flow. We have such, uh, you know, this this area and, and, and Langley's heritage are so many great things and people uh, that we can explore and learn from. So uh, this is something, please look in the future. We're going to try and do an annual uh, Wright Brothers lecture again, and we may migrate it to the fall. We're still working on that. But uh, again, it's, it's uh, I, I think it's a really good way to share. Uh, we've, there's just so much learning here. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, it's such a heritage. So with that, uh, let me introduce Dan, um, Mr. Marin. He's a friend of mine, and we've worked together through the Ground Test Technical Committee with AIAA and a number of other things. But let me read his bio here real quick. It's a, he's an independent contractor now, employed through the Scientific Research Corporation for the Test Resource Management Center. He advises on hypersonic test challenges and helps us to develop workforce development strategies for the organization. He is currently assigned to the DDRNE Joint Hypersonic Transition Office, where he advises on hypersonics, university engagement, and workforce development strategies. He has participated in the formation of a new university consortium for applied hypersonics. Prior to retirement in March 2020, well, sort of a first retirement, I guess, failed yeah, failed retirement, <laughs> um, Mr. Marin directed the AEDC White Oak, Maryland site in the hypervelocity wind tunnel nine. He has been the US Air Force hypersonics lead at Arnold Engineering Development Center uh, and, and has more than 40 years of testing and program experience for hypersonic systems and has participated in several facility developments. He is the incoming chair of the AIAA Hypersonic Technologies and Aerospace Planes High Task Technical Committee. He is chair of the AIAA Ground Test Technical Committee and participates in national facility studies and has launched an innovative hypersonic workforce development pilot for the TRMC. I'm going to add one thing that he, he did when he was at uh, Tunnel 9, one of a lot of things, but I thought it was so cool his, his involvement with the local University of Maryland aerospace program. And he'd bring, this, he and I are working together on some workforce things. And it kind of inspired me to do this because he, uh, uh, he would bring students in and give them really hard problems to work on in the tunnel, not telling them it, that it hadn't been solved before. And, and, uh, and, and, and they would really advance this, you know, the knowledge about it. In some cases they had some breakthroughs, others they'd learned a lot what didn't work but it was a whole really good learning experience. And that was a way to bring these young people into the hypersonics uh, ecosystem, because even if they couldn't come to the tunnel nine, they would stay in the ecosystem. It was a way to kind of grow the workforce. So I thought that was really cool. And one of the things that inspired me to, to work on uh, aerospace workforce. So with that, Dan, please. Now, first to correct the record, it's not over 40 years, it's only 40 years. So I did not know Orville or Wilbur. So it's funny when you're asked to give a speech or a talk on history, and you're not a history major, you start to think, okay, I guess I'm old, right? But I think that's okay. And so that allows me to put on my reading glasses. But interestingly enough, last week while I was traveling in Tennessee, now it's hard to see you. See, this is the problem with getting old. Um, last week while traveling in Tennessee, I was at the Arnold Engineering Development Complex and also the University of Tennessee Space Institute. We have research going on there, met with the research PIs. And of course, when I do that and visit a university, any of the 110 that are in our consortium right now, I like to meet with the students. And so the students are really where it's at. Workforce is really where my heart has been, um, but, Sitting with these students, we like to have a round table question and answer period where we kind of get together. They ask hard questions. I kind of search my soul to try to answer them. And one thing I realized just last week is that every question on a variety of topics that they could ask in hypersonics, I was able to find something in my past, in my experience that helped me answer that question and has say something relevant to the conversation. 
And so it was exactly that moment where I realized that I am the Forrest Gump of hypersonics. And so now you, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with Forrest Gump, he was uh, certainly not responsible for all the great things that happened in history, but he found himself there when they happened. And sometimes even knowing the people that did it. And so it's amazing in his lifetime as he was there for so many interesting things, I figured that I could actually relate. And so, okay, what are we here for today? Today, we're gonna to discuss the history of hypersonics. And so one of the terms you've probably heard many times is, if you do not know history, you will be doomed to repeat it. And so I started thinking about that for hypersonics and I said, well, that's not necessarily too bad. When we look at our hypersonic history, we may come to the conclusion that doomed to repeating that may not be that terrible. And so at that point, I think that um, when we're done here at the end of today, maybe you will agree with me on that point that our hypersonic history together has been pretty amazing. A couple of caveats first. Uh, first of all, all the opinions will be my own. While I do actually support the Test Resource Management Center and the JHTO, Joint Hypersonic Transition Office for DOD, everything you'll hear today are pretty much my opinions uh, shaped by those that I know. And so um, with that, our second caveat will be sometimes you'll hear things that don't sound exactly true based on something that you know. It's because I want to talk in this open format about hypersonics and everything we can say about hypersonics is not necessarily in the open. So uh, what I want to do is bring relevant programs and relevant experience and talk about those lessons today. So if you call me out on those and I don't give you an answer, you can assume that's why. And then third and, and finally, um, I am a test guy. I spent my pretty much early career in hypersonic test and evaluation. And so most of my opinions and ideas come from a background of test. And so uh, with that, we're done. Are there any questions? No, you, you really don't get off that easy. A uh, little bit more. All right. Um, so hypersonics. Hypersonics, of course, is back in vogue today. It's hard to go to anywhere and not hear a conversation about hypersonics. Um, the typical conversation usually falls back to, boy, the U.S. is behind country A in this, or boy, we have to catch up to country B in that. The U.S. needs to hurry up and accelerate this specific technological advance because we're way behind. And so today I don't talk about any of that. My conversation in hypersonics today will be a little bit more positive and optimistic, mainly because Steve told me that we're at a luncheon and that's a little bit better for digestion instead of the, the prior conversation. But our hypersonic history together, and when I say together, I mean industry working with NASA, the DOD and our universities has been nothing short, or short than uh, amazing. If you think about where we've been, um, we've seen some amazing accomplishments with some pretty heavy headwinds, right? Hypersonics. Our environment alone means we measure speed in terms of miles per second. At those speeds, we develop temperatures that will melt any metal. And we create chemistry that make organic chem majors blush. And so succeeding in hypersonics has never been a guarantee throughout our right about 80 year history right now and we've done pretty good. So if we are indeed doomed to repeating history, then I'll take that because I think that our future in hypersonics is gonna be quite bright. And I believe it'll probably arrive sooner than you might expect. And so I think doomed to repeat history is fine. At this current time, you're thinking, okay, 15 minutes on the first chart, he's got 33. Uh, this, we better have dinner as well at this luncheon, so. Um, and so I will get started, but before I do, I wanna say one last thing. I wanna thank Steve Dunn for putting together this meeting, this uh, inviting me here. I'm humbled to be talking to you. Uh, if you know Steve at all, he's been at the forefront of so many things. He is one of those folks that I've looked to in my past to make sure that uh, I can be the Forrest Gump by being close to those who actually accomplish things. And so um, one of the things I know about Steve, he's one of the most energetic, lifelong learners I've ever met, and I owe you a lot. So thank you, Steve, for putting this together today. Okay, our hypersonic heritage as we aspire towards systems. Today's talk, I hope, will be walking through some of our shared experiences and systems to where 
we had some hard challenges. And uh, in all of those cases, I think we'll find out that good old American ingenuity uh, solved some challenges where if we didn't do that back in those days, if we didn't come up with an interesting way to succeed and move on, then instead of me talking about our heritage and hypersonics today, I might be talking to you about how I invented the perfect whiskey cherry and I'm, I'm selling that for a business. And so if you wanna know that story, you have to come to the Embassy Suites bar tonight. We can talk more about the whiskey cherries there. Um, but one thing that, one theme that actually comes through our entire history is that we have never, on any system that I'm aware of, knew all the physics. We didn't have all the information. We couldn't even gather all of the data. And so in this environment that I described before that is so daunting, not having the tools that can really completely describe the physics would mean that it would be very hard to succeed in anything, and yet we have. And so for that, and thinking of how that happened, I think that uh, we have a bright future ahead of us. So with that, I'm actually gonna go ahead and start um, our presentation. So the first thing I need to do is figure out how to get my charts up, since currently I have a picture of myself, which isn't helpful. And so maybe Matt will help me. I'll step away and chit chat more on this side. Since I speak loud enough, you still probably can hear me in the back. And so as we start to move forward, um, interestingly enough, this is what I said before, but in the 80 years, right, we started in like the 40s or 50s. We can kind of uh, debate when we really got our first start. But you can think about some of what we did in the 40s and 50s, thinking about hypersonics as being something mathematically that is possible. And in that short 80 years, you look at where we've come. And I think if you look at the systems we have, demonstrators, the type of technologies we've moved forward, it's clear to me that um, we are at a place of success that uh, really was not guaranteed. And I think that we are here. A lot of what we did, though, was easy compared to the hypersonic missions to come. You know, we relied on the fact that we were protecting ourselves thermally from hypersonics that happened to us mostly in the past. In the future, we're trying to get efficient with that, which means air breathing engines and aircraft like operations and making hypersonics routine. And that job actually means we're going to have to be more precise, learn more and have a lot more information about this systems than we ever did before. Since it's a history presentation, I felt allowed to go back to a presentation that I actually made 15 years ago. So in 2008, I put together this chart, this set of charts, and I've added a few things since then. But, but the best way to view history is to look at the present and find out how much of that came true and how much we still need to do. And so I always start my history presentations with this same presentation I gave at a plenary in 2008. And of course, that plenary uh, was given by, and as I mentioned, being the Forrest Gump, I was able to know Mark Lewis, Dick Hallian, John Adams, Mike George, Jim Pittman, John Burton, Johnny Armstrong. Those are the people that helped me create that presentation in 2008. And so we'll walk a little bit through that today. First, we'll start with ancient history. And so now, just like I wasn't there for the Wright brothers, I was not there for these either, but I actually learned from Dick Hallian about some of the things that happened. We were flying, right? We as a world were flying hypersonics. If you look at the um, A4, right, of Mach 7, right? And then down here, even if you look here at the bumper whack, Mach 7.6, X17 was Mach 14.4, clearly hypersonic, rocket powered. We were um, looking into the environment of hypersonics even back then. There even were wind tunnels. One of the ones working at White Oak, we stole from the Germans. Well, spoils of war, is that stealing? I don't know, we can get a lawyer to figure that out. But these tunnels moved from Germany to White Oak and where I worked, I got to test in this tunnel that was the very first tunnel to do hypersonic testing. And so amazingly enough, I was actually part of history. That tunnel, TESEL is still there in the lobby of Tunnel 9. You could actually touch that facility and the test article I haven't advanced the slide, uh, is still there. One of the original test articles they used in that tunnel. So it's kind of cool that, that history is still as alive and well there. At the time, um, one of the things we do in the government is study things. We love to study things. 
Um, a lot of times we um, have study paralysis where we keep studying the same thing and never get going because it seems too hard or too expensive. But back in the 40s, late 40s, close to 50, the Unitary Act was a very bold plan where most of NACA, now NASA, and the Army Air Corps, right, now the U.S. Air Force, Arnold Engineering Development Center, were born. And we built test facilities around the country at both NASA and the DOD to examine this high-speed regime, much like our predecessors, the Germans, were doing in Penamunde. And so, of course, industry and academia spring up all across where the government spends money. And this was the case here, too. And there's probably too many of them for me to mention. One of the things I like to do is I went back into the basement in Tunnel 9, and we had all these old files, you know, all yellow paper and stuff like that. And I found the second symposium on hypervelocity techniques. I couldn't find the first one. I really wanted to get the first one. I couldn't find it. But this was in 1962. I still wasn't born. Um, but I found all of these really cool topics of places that kind of still exist. Of course, Princeton uh, GDL was running hypersonics. Ames was here. Uh, Arrow, which is now the AEDC contractor, uh, they were the, Arrow was the first contractor at AEDC. Um, if you were back there and some of the old timers were, yeah, you work down at Tayro, you know, at Arrow. Steve, Steve told me that when he was one of those uh, employees back then. But as you look down here, not only did I look at some of the things they were doing as the depth of it, but the breadth, all right? We were looking at test facilities across a spectrum of technologies. And so this was back in 62. So not just building facilities, but actually using them to get smarter. Of course, the early thoughts about going fast, right? Everybody knows meant that pointy is faster. And if you go supersonic, you really want to sharp leading edges on things because drag will kill you. We find out in hypersonics eventually, NASA found out through uh, testing and analysis that blunt bodies do a much better job because it, it brings the shock wave away, which also brings that terrible heat that melts any metal um, away from you. And so our blunt body research started in earnest there and led to all of our space programs, our ability to go to the moon, and yes, in the DOD, our ability to do intercontinental travel through space and then come back hypersonically to deliver weapons. And so all of that started a long, long time ago. We were even testing in the air. And so this is where now I start to come into being. I was born in 1964, so I can actually claim to be part of this history. Um, we were looking at, and this is on our, our uh, Atlantic and Pacific ranges, we flew uh, hypersonic vehicles. These still exist. If you go to Dayton, you can put your hands on these vehicles. They're at the Air Force uh, Museum. When Dick Hallian showed me that, we had a, a private tour with Dick, and he's like, yeah, you could touch the heat shield. And I'm like, okay. Um, you know, like in the Smithsonian, they put them in glass, the heat shields, but, but there they didn't. They were right out, a little red rope around it that you can easily get by. And so, um, but here we are, Mach 15 over here, Mach 27 re-entry conditions. We were testing the atmosphere and taking data to do a few things. One is to find out why all the assumptions we had about hypersonics were completely wrong. All of the test facilities we thought we would build did not produce the types of environments that we thought they would based on our calculations. And so flight test was very important in helping us understand the fact that we don't know everything on the ground. And that's still the case. And so this easy chart over here talks a little bit about the fact that facilities like shock tunnels had claims of being able to produce um, stagnation temperatures. But when we actually build them in a real world and have to operate them, they deliver far less than that. And so it helps us understand our tools so that when we start designing these systems, we can actually do it right. And so history will shape our direction and the data that we take in flight helps ground and then the ground makes flight possible, right? That's that, that thing we have to see together. And so let's start by saying the first program I wanna talk about is the space shuttle program, um, which I will talk about X-15 in relation to that. Okay, one thing I didn't know until I started taking this history class from Dick Hallian back in 2008 was that the X-15 was a surrogate for the space shuttle, right? We didn't know how to test the space shuttle. The physics wasn't understood. We didn't have facilities that can help us. And we were certainly not going to put a man in a reentry vehicle at first on the space shuttle without being able to test it. 
However, we had no way to bring the space shuttle to hypersonic speeds in flight and our facilities couldn't do it at scale. And so we built the X-15 to rocket power fly into the edges of hypersonics where the space shuttle may seen and understand some of the physics that we didn't know. And so the X-15 research vehicle we flew in order to understand that larger vehicle that we were gonna to have to bring back at much higher speeds. And so uh, the surrogates there, at that point, we did not understand all the physics, but we were able to move ahead anyway. And by the way, that'll be a common theme as we move forward. The question always comes, do we duplicate everything or can we replicate some things? Can we rely on the fact that we have a partial simulation, maybe duplicate a few parameters or a combination of parameters, or do we have to duplicate everything? Because if we have to duplicate all the physics of the space shuttle, that program could have never been possible. Many things uh, fall into that category. The one I'll mention here is that at the time, most of our wind tunnels did not operate at the proper temperature. And so could we rely on the force and moment data from cold gas wind tunnels, Mach number, Reynolds number, and be able to understand flight controls for that vehicle, even though we don't have true temperature? And if the answer to that question was no, it would be very difficult to build that next vehicle. But fortunately, the answer to that question was yes. We were able to do a lot of work in cold gas wind tunnels that gave us most of the answer or at least reduced, reduced enough risk that we can continue the development of that program. Again, that wasn't everything. So many of you have heard this or seen this somewhere else. If you took John Anderson's courses, you probably got a piece of this. It's in all of his textbooks. But when we originally started flying the space shuttle and bringing that home, there was the whole body flap situation. So if you know the shuttle when it existed, right, it comes in, I don't know what, Brian, 32 degrees or something? I'm not the shuttle guy. Oh, okay. So who's the shuttle guy? 40. 40 degrees. Thank you. And so shuttle comes in, it's got one control surface that's going to stop it from toppling over and it's this big body flap on the bottom. And so you have to figure out where to put the body flap to trim it out so that it actually makes it home safely. All the cold gas wind tunnels, of course, gave us a nice curve for a pitching moment. And it said, yeah, somewhere around 22 degrees, that would be great. It'll trim itself out and come back to earth. And some of the heating data, if you look, you know, you, in school, you'd get a plot like that and say, I match the data perfectly. Those two data sets fall on top of one another. But if you actually look a little closer, you'll notice that pressure coefficient on the front of the vehicle was a little higher in real life. And in the back, it's a little bit lower, giving you a pitching moment this way, which means the body flap is going to have to counteract that. And so what we did find out is that in real world, when you look at equilibrium air, that curve looks a little bit different. And you would need a little bit more body flap in order to trim out that vehicle. And of course, we have conservatism in our design, especially in those days when we can afford that. And the body flap was able to go to that level, and that shuttle came home safely. And then we learned a good lesson and we started developing some of our capabilities to test when we needed to in places like shock tunnels that could give us some clues as to the equilibrium chemistry. And of course, um, a lot of data was taken in flight. We have measurements um, on every shuttle flight that we do that inform then how we use our tools and how we go forward. And let's be certain, X-15 accomplished 199 flights in order to start to understand the environment of hypersonics. Uh, Mark Lewis always says there was 200 flights if you consider that Scott Crossfield was blown across the runway um, on one of those flights. The airplane only flew 199 times. And so um, the shuttle also did its share of testing that way too. And so if you think about X-15, how many hours did we fly at Mach 27? right, with that vehicle, none. Mach 14, none. Mach 10, none. One minute above Mach 6, right? So even small amounts of data are useful in order to unlock the clues of this. But even with that, that small amount of data, we were able to take that database and start to develop the space shuttle. So very incredible. Of course, it doesn't end there, right? We do all kinds of other testing. Iron Bird up in that corner, rocket testing. We fly them around on the wings of big aircraft to test out the theories that we know. So testing comes in. We do a lot of incremental tests 
and try to figure out how things work in an incremental way before we bring them to flight. And we've done a lot of that. I think I'll show the space shuttle did the same thing. I can have like 10 charts on this to go ahead. But uh, before we actually sent this to space, right, we let this land, we did captive carry tests and uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of testing both on the ground and in flight before we started to develop that vehicle. One thing you should know, of course, if you wanna make an omelet, you do have to break some eggs. And so on the X-15 program, 199 flights, uh, one of those flights ended like this, a crash landing in the flats. Um, the pilot actually walked away. Um, I think he had his vertebrae fused, so he was about an inch shorter, but he walked away from that and I believe flew again. Um, but more importantly, when that vehicle crashed, there might've been a bunch of really, really excited engineers after they found out the pilot was okay, because they were already innovating on improvements to the Dash 2 aircraft to make it more capable that would get us to the higher Mach numbers. And the budget of the program probably wouldn't have gotten them to be able to use that aircraft, but it had to substitute for this one for the remainder of the flight test program. So sometimes when we have mistakes and problems in flight and ground, it really leads to our successes. When I talk to students, and they tell me how successful they were in an experiment, usually my answer is, well, you didn't try hard enough. You have to try that experiment until you fail and you don't understand something, and then you'll start to learn. And then you get the wide eye look and it's like, you know, okay, you know, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. But in this program, you can see they had their share of failures. And I think that led to much of the understanding that actually came out of that program and the subsequent um, shuttle program. So, okay, new programs emerged. Let me build this one out. There it is. Um, I was a part of these programs. So SDIO, right, termed Star Wars because it's pretty much an impossible job, right? We are going to accelerate a missile to hypersonic speeds, find track and destroy a target also moving at hypersonic speeds and do that reliably, right? Back in, in those days, no one really believed that. And uh, at the same time, we set out on a second mission, right? Take what we learned in hypersonics and build the X-30, which the media called the Orient Express, right? We'll go from here to uh, Japan in two hours, I think it was. And so now that one is easy. That just accelerates from ground to space with just one engine hypersonically and not a rocket either. And then return home, home safely, turn around and do that again, right? Both of these missions, impossible jobs. And so let me discuss each one separately. Uh, the first one, as I remember a story from missile defense, um, duplicate or replicate. These systems actually, remember we have to find a target and then go kill it, right? And so how do you see a target? Radar is not good enough. It's not gonna get us close enough. So you have to actually have to have a, have a seeker on the vehicle itself. Well, that seeker uses the hot spot in the sky and it goes and finds the hot re-entry target, right? Okay, so it needs a window. Well, it, even Mach 7, Mach 8, right? Glass doesn't work that well. So we use gems like diamond, garnet, sapphire. And they don't even survive very well, right? So we have to cover them with metal until about a second before we need to use them. And then jettison a metal shroud and, and start using the window. And that's all we have to do. Well, those metal shrouds, right? How are we gonna test those? So the thought was, can we use subscale light shrouds in a cold gas wind tunnel and tell us what we need to know about this system? Because if that's possible, we can go ahead and finish the design of missile defense interceptors that operate in the atmosphere and everything's good. As it turned out, we did those tests. We actually did them at Tunnel 9 and it, the shrouds came off beautifully and they went and they were ready to go to flight. Of course they went to flight and um, didn't quite work. Shrouds started to come off. They started to crumble. The vehicle spun. They had to destroy it. The guy said, you are never coming back to this range again until you show us with engineering data that that system works in a real environment that's appropriate. None existed. So that program, the entire missile defense system that we all rely on today would have not been possible because of that one piece of information we didn't know. And so what they did is they said, well, we've got this other Tunnel 9 facility. It operates, it's big enough. It operates at high enough pressure at Mach 10. If we only expand it to Mach 8, we can match the dynamic pressure. And then we can do, find out that the dynamic pressure and a high enough Mach number 
would be, if you had those two things right, you'll reduce your risk enough. So we did those tests. We were able to uh, prove the data, go back to flight and succeed. Since I'm a test guy, I always like to add this final part is that in a wind tunnel, right, full scale actual deployment system, 10 pounds of hardened stainless steel each coming off at Mach 8 at a real pressure for Mach 8 at whatever thousand feet, I don't think I can still say, but it's low enough that it's high pressure. Um, 100 PSI, so a lot of PSF, right? Where do those shrouds go? They go down the wind tunnel and they go into the vacuum sphere. And so, um, all right, I've got still 15 minutes, so I'm gonna tell the story. I can remember the commander said, the commander of our Navy base said, okay, you're gonna do what? In my wind tunnel, on my base? Tell me what the worst on worst on worst case scenario is. What could happen? We said, well, sir, the shrouds are st hardened stainless steel. They'll come off at Mach 8. Um, if they don't slam against the walls and deform, they'll probably still retain their aerodynamic shape enough to fly down the diffuser pipe at about Mach 4. They will enter the sphere somewhere between Mach 3 and Mach 4, hardened stainless steel. And if the pointy end is first, it'll go through the sphere like butter, still retaining its aerodynamic shape and end up in the condominium complex out back. <laughs> By the way, I lived in that condominium complex. I made sure I was testing that day. And so, you know, the end of that story is, but sir, we have this risk mitigation plan that means none of that's gonna happen. And we did the test, it worked. Um, nothing went through the sphere. The plate that is on the back, we had a catcher's mitt and a extending, we went into the sphere and erected a catcher's mitt of steel rope. I mean, you know, inch thick steel rope, three of those into a catcher's mitt. So a lot of energy in hypersonics. All right, enough stories, I'm gonna run out of time. Uh, scramjets, right? Everybody knows that, you know, back in 1958, the Weber McKay study said that mathematically scramjets are possible. This is easy. No moving parts, right? Air in, add fuel. It's hot enough. It's going to burn anyway, right? And so we knew that back in 58. And so we said, okay, we will develop an airplane, right? And so uh, Tony DuPont came up with this elegant pointy come, you know, um, configuration. It was going to meet all the the needs of NASP, and then of course, hydrogen fueled, it didn't meet its performance, so you have to add more, more fuel, adds more weight, makes the thing bigger, adds more weight, and so that vehicle could never close. Eventually, 10 years later, it looked like that vehicle pretty much could have almost closed. The engines almost worked. It took us 10 years to get the test facilities ready to do that job, and one thing you find out in any program that the time it takes in a program is directly proportional inversely to the political cycle. So, you know, Congress every couple of years, Senate every couple of years, president, so we get budgets every couple of years. So if you're not, if you think you need to go 12 years in a program, you better have a lot of success. And we couldn't get everything ready by the time NASP came, including flight corridors, right? Because we have to fly this thing. And if you're flying at, you know, Mach 15, Mach 20, you, you, you use up a lot of real estate fairly quickly. And, uh, but we got there eventually in all of these systems. And so um, as we look at this, in the 60s, we looked at missiles. In the 80s, we looked at uh, endo-atmospheric defense, not NASP in the 90s. None of them happened in the years that we thought they would. Eventually, lots of advancements like capable computers, material advances, test facilities and diagnostics meant that all of those programs were able to bring another program and inform them, things like X-43 here at NASA, following on high fly and X-51, we were able to take 2D scramjets, which were what NASP was about, to flight and prove that they work. And today those systems are built on that. Missile defense interceptors, really, we didn't see that till 1995, until we were able to prove those technologies. And of course the um, uh, 2D scramjet flown in 2004. Right? So it takes decades before we really do that. But the key is we have to pass on that technology and not stop. So as we look forward to future systems, and I've already told you that our future will be successful and come here sooner than you think. So it's, it's a fact. Um, as we look to those systems, do we know everything to build a large platform hypersonic multi-engine vehicle? 
Do we know everything even to do a missile scale vehicle that can fly Mach 8 perhaps? Can we build a very precise missile defense interceptor? Do we know all the physics? Do we understand what it takes to get there? The answer is undoubtedly no. But based on our history of taking what we do know, assuming a little risk, I'm confident that these systems will be there and we will be able to succeed in each of these ways. And the key is we'll go far enough to reduce that risk because if we are relegated to duplicating everything, right, we will prove nothing. And so we do have to be smart about what we know. I think I had some get off the stage charts. This one was kind of a build. I think it's more motherhood than anything, but it kind of shows how our programs go in a certain direction, technology follows to make programs possible, and our facilities try to keep up by adding diagnostics and capabilities, right? What we at TRMC try to do is get 10 or 12 years ahead of that and start to look at what might become a program and what might they need. But mites don't usually get you funding in the budget, so it's, it's a difficult dance. But I am um, emboldened by the fact that my boss has asked us to look into S&T and to say, where is S&T going? So that those flowers, when they bud, they will become the next T&E programs and the next acquisition. So we can start to look at our horizon a little further when we look at what capabilities and what test techniques are required. And then finally, this is from a, a 2001 study, why and whither hypersonics in the US Air Force, where their final chart said in 2001, and right here, Right. When we were just starting again to, for that upslope, was saying that hypersonics is at the same crossroads as supersonics was 50 years ago. For all of these reasons, inadequate funding, serious ground test shortfalls, inherent design risk, controversial demonstrators that don't seem to work, uh, economic conditions that are kind of disadvantaged, disadvantageous, and really no operational requirement. Right. And so uh, what they said then was, would a Reasonable person today say we made a mistake in investing in supersonic technologies. So now that that was 2001, I used his chart in 2008. And I said in 2008, where we were is, I guess it builds, there we go. Hypersonics is no longer at the same crossroads. In fact, we have aligned our federal infrastructure. If you look at where we're going in hypersonics, I've never seen such alignment as we have today in the US. You know, we are all singing on the same sheet of music. We have funded about half a billion dollars of T&E facilities just in the last few years, and they're asking us to fund more. We have inherent design risks but, and uncertainties, but those are being worked now instead of just being looked at as difficult problems. And we have less controversial demonstrators. Our demonstrators now are starting to succeed in ways that are opening some eyes. We have increased funding. I have not seen, at least in the DOD, funding like this in hypersonics. And then, of course, we have a stated and obvious operational requirement. And so did I build this again in 2023? I think everything is the same, except we are now aligned. We funded these, and we are organizing S&T even in our T&E infrastructure. And so when I look at this, I see this as why I'm optimistic about hypersonics. And when I look from 1950 to 2020, and I look at all the flights we did and all the successes that we've had, and now I, you will agree with me, we have had an amazing history that points to us being very successful in the future. So I am not worried. And with that, are there any questions? There are two microphones, so if you want to stand up and uh, ask your question, uh, feel free to do that. We have at least 10 minutes where uh, you can ask me questions and you'll see if my opening statement that I could actually reach back to something I learned 20 years ago and answer your question. I should mention too, I forgot, that is these recordings, we're gonna put it on a YouTube channel. Dan, Dan knew this, but you all didn't, so. Uh, <laughs> but I would appreciate any questions. If you would come up to the mic so we are recording. So who has the first question? Always takes that one icebreaker and then the... Microphone, please, sir. 
talked about, you showed some of the uh, cycles, the cyclical nature, it kind of, we call them boom bust cycles. And so it affects workforce, it affects capabilities, uh, readiness, uh, both computational, experimental, the, and, and the advocacy for those things. Can you speak a little bit to, from a historical perspective and maybe looking forward, do you see that maybe with all this going on now, it seems like things have aligned better. Are we are we moving away from those boom bust cycles? Thank you, Steve, appreciate the question. As I look back, and I've lived most of those cycles, not the first one, I don't think, but um, I've actually lived and worked in, in those cycles. And you're right, what happens in those cycles is it's great when everybody's um, heading in the up direction, but you're all smart people and you are valuable in other places besides hypersonics. So when the funding cuts off and the programs go away, you will find something credible to do. And here at NASA, you understand how a PI has to continue their research, that starting and stopping research is not the best way for discovery and innovation. And so to answer your question, I believe that I have never seen the conditions today in the current cycle. Yes, we will have the political cycle and hypersonics is hot now. Uh, 10 years from now, it might be grasshoppers, I don't know. But what I have seen now is that there is a requirement, an operational requirement, and the technology we have today is ready. Those two things have never happened. In all those programs we had before, we either had an obvious operational requirement like missile defense, but the facilities and technologies were not ready. And then for space access, we didn't have an operational requirement, but we almost had technologies ready. Now I think we have both at the same time. And so that's why I think this time is a little bit different. And it's also longer already and more involved than the other cycles that we've had. Who has the next question? Probably a silly question. I assume that T&E stands for test and evaluation, but what does s and stand for? Ah, so in the T&E world, which is test and evaluation, comes from the uh, RD T&E, Research Development Test and Evaluation. Uh, we talk about those capabilities that are s and science and technology. And so typically uh, in my day job for the TRMC, we look at the large T&E that help programs get to where they need to be. But we don't concern ourselves as much with s and right? That's the research labs, NASA, others do their s and and those types of facilities are different. What we are trying to do is look at those now to make sure that we can use s and and make sure that it's moving in the right direction so that when they get to T&E, it works the first time and we can be a lot more efficient in our development. So T&E test and evaluation at the end of your development cycle, s and in the beginning of your development cycle, where you are coming up with concepts and ideas. Another question? Yes, sir. So um, you mentioned early on that we designed a lot of vehicles without knowing all the physics. And in today's world, we're developing more and more numerical techniques that potentially can solve some of those physical challenges, but we're not there yet. There are a lot of big open questions. Where do you see the synergy between these numerical techniques that are really coming online that have made a lot of progress kind of being folded into this in the future? Do we still need that really strong synergy between the two? Or do you see that shifting more towards um, the numerical techniques? Thank you. I think the answer is yes, but I'll expound. For my entire career, right, we were told as a tester that computations would supplant testing. We would not leave these big, heavy, expensive facilities forever and ever. Uh, but what we knew is that we relied on those computational capabilities to actually design the test. But those computational capabilities were not right until we applied data from somewhere, right? Still, much of this physics is unknown. Truth in this flight regime is unknowable. And so both the computational capabilities and the test facilities are wrong. And together, they have the possibility of being right. And so I believe the future is in modeling and simulation. There are things that we need to do that I cannot even imagine in the next 10 years I can design or build a test facility that can do. And so we absolutely have to put enough physics in our computation from the capabilities we have to extend those capabilities with some risk to a place where we can adequately compute those things that we need. And so more than ever now, I think that nexus between computation and test, both flight and ground, have to be um, 
joined at the hip. I remember when I was uh, head of White Oak and one of my young engineers actually got an AIAA award in the DC chapter. And they asked me to introduce him. And uh, it's another old joke, here we go again. So I, know, I knew at that point, the difference between being old and young. Because when I trained as an aerospace engineer, you kind of had to choose between being a test person or being a computational person. They went different ways and they hardly ever talked to each other. When this individual who was getting the award grew up, right, it was already ingrained in them that they worked with the, the modelers to do their test. And so I had to decide whether I was a young old engineer or an old young engineer. And, and I decided to call myself a young old engineer. Uh, but, but this time, I think I'm just an old engineer. But I think that's the key is that where we are now is that no one thinks of test or modeling in a vacuum. And if they do, then those should be in a vacuum. Go to space. Who has the next question? I'll fill up some time. So you've you stated just, we've, uh, came in front of him, but go ahead, Brian. No, you're good. You stated that we've got you know national hypersonic needs and missions uh, from the DoD perspective. Where do you see NASA fitting into that picture and helping out? Thank you, Brian. NASA has always been with us in hypersonics in DoD. We don't always like to admit that. Sometimes you're ahead of us and we're not paying attention to hypersonics, and then we're paying attention, and then you guys decide to scale back for other reasons. And so what, what I've mainly seen is that we rely on NASA for that deep understanding, big brain thinking of the stuff we get wrong. And in the DOD, we do have the research labs that do that, but they are also very directed towards systems a lot of times. So many times our relationship with NASA brings a component to our understanding that we just don't get in the DOD. I personally found that working with NASA, many of the people in this room have brought a perspective to me as someone working in the DOD that I would never have come to on my own. And so I think without NASA being that steady hand of forcing us to think a little bit differently about the techniques and analysis that we do, we might go down the wrong path. And so I think we can't get there unless we're there together. Uh, the research is driven by the applications that are deemed reasonable, useful, competitive. Uh, the best ones for hypersonics that I'm aware of, besides the deployed systems, is uh, doubling the range of an air launch missile with fixed weight mm -hmm. because you don't have to carry the oxygen. So you can double range for, you know, with an air breather. Uh, the hypersonic boost glide, which is not air breathing, the entry vehicles. Uh, if you can maneuver and propel, we've been doing maneuvering since the AMARs a long time ago. Uh, really hard to intercept. Uh, hard in the sense of the aircraft carriers are going out beyond Guam. And sinking Guam looks interesting. Uh, the uh, way to counter that and to obviate that application is, of course, to intercept these things. And we had a Sprint anti-missile missile in the 60s, which I worked on and developed the fins for, uh, which would work. The problem was we stopped that because there were, nobody had a maneuvering propelling target to deploy it for. So we stopped. So we need to go back. Uh, there's some Israeli work that says dart on dart may be doable. Uh, they've got the control stuff to do it. And so we need to go back and look at that. Uh, uh, I've been approached on lasers and lasers won't intercept these things because NASA went into Jupiter on Galileo in 95 at 47 kilometers per second. And a little bit of ablator protected it fine from a radiation dose that was massively larger than anything anybody's laser is going to put on it. And you can uh, Faraday cage these things for the high power microwave. So that's not going to work either. 
the Navy's got a real problem uh, with these things. And uh, we've been working mostly on uh, attack systems, not on the defense of these things. And so we need to do more on the defense. Uh, then there's air breathing to orbit. Uh, I was deeply involved with the X-30. Uh, and the weight finally went south bad uh, because it was discovered that in the calculations, everybody was assuming laminar flow from the nose, even though they said they weren't, but that's what was baked in the code. And, and when that changed, the whole weight went south. But since the 70s, every time we've looked at air breathing to orbit, we come up with huge increases in dry weight because if you try to air breathe to orbit, you can only do it from Mach 5-ish up to uh, maybe Mach 12, if you're lucky. Uh, so you need a rocket, you need some way to get up to Mach 4-5, up, up the ramjet thing, you know, and then the scramjet, and you sum all of that weight, and the answer is no. Okay, I, I don't so help know me frame anybody the answer that's to your got question. a viable approach that is competitive to what SpaceX now has for, for, for going to Leo. All right, SpaceX, the new one, the Starship, uh, they're projecting $20 a kilogram to orbit. The SLS is quoted as $62,000 to orbit. So that's uh, three orders of magnitude cheaper. And the air breather is somewhere around, oh, $10,000, $15,000 a pound. Okay. I'll need you to get to the question quickly because well, well, I know well, that. Well, 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 the question is, what's the applications you see, okay, besides the ones I've quoted? Thank you. So you've quoted a few applications that we've thought about for a long time. What I will say now is that defensive applications like you've talked about, because now you know, we're not the only ones thinking of hypersonics, actually becomes important now, right? And so I believe at least the department right, is leaning forward in that way. What that does is um, that helps us understand that scenario. And all of the things that we do are not just to build systems others have, but to pretty much add to the, the complicated list of things that we have in our arsenal. And so we are looking ahead at saying, we just want to have a capability since we've already got it to the point. And as you pointed out, we have not finalized those designs, but finalized the technology that's already there today. And as uh, the research and engineering director, uh, Mike Griffin, who you all know from NASA, told me on my first day and the rest of us, I only want you to do two things. One, field ready technology right now, and two, never lose technical superiority in this area. That's all you have to do. So it's, oh, okay, is that all we have to do? And so I think the, the short answer in this arena, what I would say is, is put those things in the field that we know how to do today. And then two, make sure that we have a robust S&T, science and technology plan that assures that we have the technology needed for whatever we wanna do in the future. And so that's about the best answer I could proffer. Do you think that there's enough very inventive research in hypersonics as opposed to trying to get the usual stuff out in the inventory? I think, yes. I've seen a, a, a concentration that we want both now, right? Usually we take the seed corner of our S&T and pay for those things we think are quick, right? But these days we're actually paying some attention to both. But Are it's up to us to make sure better, we continue that. Better technology now? Do I think we have it? Uh, you know, uh, do you think there is sufficient effort on inventing really different hypersonic technology, you know, across the discipline spectrum? I think the answer to that will always be no. Okay, thanks. What do you think, Steve? We can do one more? Last question, please. Thank you. I Better make it, it a good one because they're all saying I could have asked. <laughs> yeah, sorry, folks. Um, 
Thank you again for, for doing this talk. Uh, my question is more of a general one. Um, I work in the hypersonic research uh, materials group here at NASA. And um, you spoke a lot about a lot of the military applications and the research that's been done on the government side in progressing hypersonics uh, in the history of that. I'm curious if you have any comment on any history, if any, of commercial hypersonics, and if you've seen development in interest in commercial hypersonics uh, in more recent years, particularly in reusable hypersonics, uh, where we stand on that and maybe how we can drive more interest and innovation in that area. Thank you. I will answer that question in two different ways. And since no one else gets to answer a question, then I can just leave it at that and you can't say anything. Um, so industry's role, right? So I mentioned two goals, right? We're going to get what we have now to the field. Industry is the way we do that, right? We don't do that in the government, you know, especially in the DOD, right? We invent new things. We build a couple of them, but our partnership with industry and, and the industrial complex is how we actually field these and make a lot of them. Right. So right now, the role with industry is to bring them up to speed on where we're going and have them help us get there. But going back to Dennis's important comment, right, industry also right, is going to be involved with us as we look at the new technology and the new research, because it's not just enough to come up with a new concept. Some of those concepts need to move to application, transition to something useful, and industry helps us with that. And so one of the things I'm doing in my second day job at the JHTO, working with the university consortium, we have brought in a lot of the university research, starting to look at the labs and taking those early research, maybe barely applied, mating them with a transition partner from industry. And industry then can help them understand some of the challenges and wickets they will need to be successful as they transition interesting technology, maybe some crazy technology, things that we just can't do today and make it happen. And so I think it is that combination of government working with industry, using the brains that we have in academia and finding good ways to do that, to come to that next solution for the future. And so with that, I thank you very much for attending and I uh, hope you had a good lunch.